just stop for a minute here and see if there are questions about the structure or function of these county commissions. Okay, um, so now if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and raise your hand or type them in. Um, I have one hand raised from Cheryl. Uh, let's see if she has the ability to speak. Cheryl, are you there? Okay, Cheryl, um, I think you should probably go ahead and type in a question. Let's see if any others come in. So go ahead and type in a question or raise your hand if you have one right now. And we're about to get to the discussion of the specifics of the budget and whatnot, so we'll, we'll dig into that. That's probably where most questions are. Okay. Okay, not seeing any, so why don't you keep going? Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. Okay, so now is the, the really difficult part of, of life, which is the state budget. Um, so in response to the, the budget crisis, really starting about three years ago, um, the legislature and the governor began to come more actively to First Five to say, help us out. Um, what we've seen is that the state commission, um, as a state agency and as a single entity as opposed to 58 county entities, has been able to be um, very responsive. They, they bailed out Mr. Mib, the Healthy Families Program, in the current year. Um, I'm sure they will be asked to do so again next year. Actually, they did it the first time at the end of the previous year when, when Mr. Mib was running short on funds. And at, in that instance, county commissions also chipped in. But that's a really difficult process because you've got 58 county commissions all having to send money and, it, and they have to only pay for kids from their county. It's a very difficult sort of accounting problem. So the next time around when asked for money to support healthy families, the state first five commissions simply made that contribution. Um, county commissions in the mean, at, at the same time, oh, and of course the state First Five Commission also just uh, contributed at its last meeting $50 million to early start for the current year because of a, the gap caused by the governor's um, blue pencil of the current year budget. County commissions ha are responding very differently. They're really waiting to see what needs are emerging locally and how best to address them. And um, what we're seeing is a huge variety of responses. We are seeing a lot of commissions increasing funding for programs that just deal with basic needs, food banks, emergency clothing, that sort of thing. We're seeing increased access to health care, um, expanded contracts with clinics and other providers for people who are falling you know, out, of the, out of systems where they got health care. Um, we're seeing much more uh, funding for domestic violence programs, mental health and substance abuse, where that need has increased, probably related to the recession. Um, we are seeing um, individual grantees needing more money because of other funding sources drying up just to keep operating, and so we're seeing contracts being expanded. In a number of communities, First Fives have, pr have provided leadership in bringing together other funders to create special funds for emerging needs, and in some cases, county commissions have simply put some money aside to be available for emerging needs. Um, but it, again, it's a little bit cumbersome because they're, they're public entities and they have to you know, have a fair and open process in providing funding. And so it's never like turning on a dime, but they're, they're working very hard to figure out how to make funds available uh, for needs as they, as they emerge without supplanting. So I thought we could do poll number one here and give this a try and uh, just see what, what okay. our participants are observing. OK, here we go. So please respond to the poll. You can actually select uh, more than one question, I mean more than one answer. OK. People are voting. We need some music here. <laughs> I think you can provide it. <laughs> able to see this on my screen, right? Oh, is it not showing up for you? I'm sorry. Uh, there must be some... I'm not voting, so... Right, that's I probably can't. why. I can't, you know, um, pack the ballot box. <laughs> yeah. So far we've got 71% voting. Still climbing. 
Do another few seconds. Make sure you get your pole in. Okay, I'm going to close it and share the answers. Do you see this, Sherry? Mm -mm. Okay, looks like uh, people answered, 3% uh, said no, I haven't seen any change. 39% uh, said yes, it's hard to get agencies to answer the phone. 75% said yes, longer wait times. 61% says families are paying more out of pocket now, and 86% say families aren't qualifying for as many services. Wow. Wow, this is great. This is really, really meaningful. Okay. Well, that's depressing. <laughs> but it's real, right? Yeah. So let's go on here. I'm trying to be a little bit aware of the time here. Um, I'm going to just go quickly through the, the recent budget history, because probably people on the call are quite familiar with this. Um, and this is really about what happened, what's happening, the, the, the subtext here is the situation where we are really seeing program pitted against program. Um, and hopefully we can talk about ways to um, mitigate that as this moves forward. You all remember Prop 1D on the, on the May ballot, uh, very directly pitted the regional center system against first five. Um, and in fact, the ballot argument was signed by the executive director of the Association of Regional Center Agencies uh, because the, it basically diverted money directly to the regional center. Now, interestingly, it didn't actually do that in the language. It just was a promise to the legislature and the governor that if this money got freed up, that's where it would go in year one. No one knew what would happen after that. But it called for a diversion of, of you know, half of the funds for five years. Um, well, obviously, when it didn't pass, um, you know, there are big holes in the budget, right? The budget was finally signed, and interestingly, <laughs> the legislature included full funding for early start, but the governor vetoed it. And in his veto message, he basically said to Department of Developmental Services, go to First Five California and get the money. Um, and so what what Department of Developmental Services did is they, they instructed regional centers to continue fully funding Early Start in the current year. Um, and just last month, the First Five Commission, as we're approaching the end of the fiscal year, the First Five Commission uh, allocated that $50 million because there was a giant hole in the DDS budget. All of the regional centers had been funding Early Start kind of out of other money, and they were all going to end up in the hole. and so. First Five Commission came forward and, and funded it. Uh, some people said, is this supplantation? Many county councils would probably not have approved that. But the State Commission was comfortable that because of the rate of expansion of the program, because the kids who were coming in were new to it, that they could um, defend against the charge that it was supplantation. Uh, now, this does not address the fact that the previous year, the whole program had you know, there had been that, that large unallocated cut that resulted in the whole program shrinking down with the new eligibility standards and the creation of the prevention program. But even just in this current year, um, there, there was this issue. Uh, so this is where we wanted to do a quick poll number two, because it, it, it's sort of a subset of the answers you gave in your last poll, but specific to early start. Um, and this is about whether the impact from the previous year, even though this $50 million has been made whole, is having a real significant um, effect on kids getting to early start. OK. The poll's in progress. <laughs> People are voting. And while people are voting, Sherry, can you clarify for me what you mean by supplanted? Okay. This is, um, you know, if, if there is not a clear definition. Basically, supplanting means using one source of fund to replace another source of funding. So, for instance, if a county decided to stop funding a program with the intent of using first five dollars to fund it instead, 
that would be supplantation. Um, this is a requirement. It exists in a lot of federal law where the feds will send money to a state and they'll say, but it can't. you have to have a maintenance of effort. You can't use this to replace what you are already doing. Um, but it gets, it, it gets defined differently. There's not a, there's not a, because there are no regulations, there's no real specific definition. And so county to county, you might see differences. Some county commissions say a program has to be defunded for a certain amount of time before they can step in and fund it. Um, and in some cases, that's a year. Sometimes it's six months. Some policies say the moment a program is defunded, first five could pick it up because it wouldn't exist otherwise. Um, but if it's defunded with the intent of using first five money, then that would be supplantation. So it's a tricky, a tricky area. And the reason it's important for county commissions is number one because they, you know, they want to follow the law. But number two. We really try very hard not to do things that result in lawsuits. And you can imagine that if there were some, some local service providers who were defunded and their money went to something that they saw as supplantation, that would just invite somebody to you know, go to the courts and say, this money shouldn't have been used that way. So county commissions are quite conservative to, uh, in their funding to make sure they don't raise the specter that they're using their money just to supplant. So when county commissions do fund an, an agency, for instance, child welfare services, um, that has been shrunk down because of budget cuts, they don't fund it for the precise thing it had been doing previously. They fund it usually by creating a new approach, or they'll fund some social worker positions, but have them doing different things, more specific to zero to five. So you'll see there are ways they can support departments that have been hurt by budget cuts. But they don't do it simply by replacing the money, generally. Does that help? Yeah, that does. Thank you. Um, OK, so people are viewing the results of the poll. It sounds like 92% said yes. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. We're really, this is, this is really important to, um, to track because those kids, we need to know who those kids are so they don't keep going. And sh Sherry, we have one question. What does yes. Mr. Mib stand for? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Mib is the medical risk insurance board that, that uh, administers the Healthy Families Program. So it's a, it's a little state agency, and its main purpose is to administer um, the Healthy Families Program, which is an insurance program for families that are low income, but not low income enough to qualify for Medi-Cal. Great. Thanks. Okay. Uh-oh, sorry. Um... Hmm, there we go. So this weird um, <laughs> chart, <laughs> let me just tell you what this is. It's a little odd. Um, but this shows you what the governor proposed in January, and it's also going to show you where he has big holes that he's trying to fill in his May revised budget, which is supposed to come out on May 14th. So you know, the governor is required to put out a, an initial budget in January for the legislature to debate. Um, and then in May, when they have a better um, a sense of what the revenues to the state are and what the caseload is in all the different service areas, they revise that budget and put out a new proposal. So in January, this is what he did with First Five. Um, the way First Five works is the, the tobacco tax is all gathered in this fund at the state level, this trust fund at the state level. 80% of it is in an account that goes directly to the county commissions, and that's that first dark pink line. So, so that's where most of the money goes, 80% of the money, county account, from which funds are transferred to the county children and families trust funds. Then within the state commission itself, there are five other funds, one, two, three, four, yeah. And a specific percentage of their 20% goes into each of those funds, and that's all according to statute. So what the governor did in his January budget is he said, okay, we have holes in Department of Developmental Services and Department of Social Services, and so we're going to put Prop 10 on the, on the ballot and do exactly what 1D did, divert 50% of it for five years. And in the budget that he was proposing in the budget year, um, which will be next year, he proposed that the amount that would be diverted, well, actually, he did a combination of diverting 50% and also taking the entire amount of fund balance that the state commission has. Um, at the time of the ballot initiative. Um, so he wanted to put $194 million into DDS from the money that otherwise would have gone to the counties, and $6 million 
from the money that would have gone to the State Commission's media account. So that $200 million, he was funding Department of Developmental Services for the types of services that are delivered by regional centers. In other words, the purchase of services budget for the regional center for all children served by the regional center in ages 0 to 5. Then he took the rest of the money that he was taking from all these other accounts that the State Commission has and giving them all to Department of Developmental Services for a range of things from child welfare services, foster care, um, adoption assistance, some SSI, SSP payments, a, a range of different things. So that was a lot of money that would go to Department of Social Services. Well, the legislature did not agree to put this on the ballot. He wanted this to go on the ballot in June so that all these funds would be coming into the state general fund um, by the time the fiscal year starts, July 1. That didn't happen because the legislature basically felt like they had just been told no last May on this very same proposal, um, and they didn't do it. So the governor now has to fill these very big holes in his May revised budget. He may do that by suggesting once again that Prop 10 go back on the ballot, or he may find other means, or he may just try to um, shrink programs even further. So we're waiting to see what he proposes. It's pretty scary. I would say that um, besides this amount of money, he, his budget also assumed ongoing voluntary contributions from the State Commission to the Healthy Families Program, like they did last year, and also another $50 million to early start for, for this coming uh, year. So they're really counting on a lot of First Live money, and we're not sure what they're going to do, given that that didn't happen yet. Someone has, the mass media account is listed twice. Yeah, and the reason is because $6 million goes to Department of Developmental Services and $87 million goes to Department of Social Services. So they're really $93 million would be coming out of that account, but it's split because it goes to two different departments. Okay, gotcha. And um, I have one hand up. Um, okay. Randall, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Um, I had asked uh, about the last year's uh, uh, the State Commission, I thought, had put money into healthy families, and that's when the issue of supplantation came up? Well, what I would say is that the issue of supplantation always comes up. Um, people are always very nervous about it. Some people felt that the State Commission's contribution um, could be could basically be viewed as supplantation because it was replacing money that the legislature would otherwise have funded. But there is an argument on the other side, and luckily we haven't had to argue this out in court anywhere, But um, because who wants to spend money on that, right? Um, but there's an argument that if you are funding children who are coming in new to the system, and we do have a system, the Healthy Families Program, growing at a fairly rapid rate because of the recession, more and more families are becoming eligible, that actually, um, and you, you know, you really can only prove this down to a T after the fact because you have to look at the actual numbers. Um, but the theory is that the money that's coming from First Life California is actually funding an ex new, you know, expansion to new children. So that's that argument. And as I say, there's a lot of uh, different interpretation, and the county commissions tend to be more conservative and more careful, just because county councils tend to be more, more conservative. Um, so that's that discussion, yeah, it does come up and it will continue to come up. And then the other issue is it's sort of a matter of risk management. How likely is it that anybody would, you know, sue them or something because people are so concerned about maintaining the Healthy Families Program and saw this as such an important part of it. Is that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. So basically the point I'm making here is that, um, you know, we're facing a pretty dire situation, which leads us to the discussion of how to, how to resist pitting some children's programs against others. You know, a lot of m members of the legislature will say, you know, there's a certain amount of protection for education funding, even though that has also been hammered badly. At least there are some constitutional protections. But when you come to Health and Human Services, there's a huge squeeze because there really aren't very significant protections. Um, 
in the area of child welfare services, we saw a very interesting response. There's a, a broad coalition of advocates, including public entities, private entities, lots of individuals, lots of advocacy organizations, ca county government itself. They came together, and their position is basically that child welfare services cannot be slashed further, and moreover, it shouldn't be funded by something that requires a vote of the of, of the um, vote. I mean, a, a vote of the citizens because it might not happen, that it's too important for the, the legislature has to fund it because otherwise, who knows? Because we saw last year with 1D that money didn't come from Prop 10. Um, so they're making a very strong showing um, in the Capitol and in the press and around the state. We sort of, you know, we've been wondering about how, how we can work better in that regard in the developmental disability world and the first five world because we really are likely, if there is another ballot measure, to be pitted against, you know, to, to have it pitted exactly the way it was last year. And in local communities, um, you know, what is the discussion? And so I don't know how many of you know Santi Rogers, who's the executive director of San Andreas Regional Center. He and I developed something, sort of a paper, and the next few slides basically go over that paper, um, kind of a one-pager entitled The Importance of Early Intervention, Collaborating for a Children's Future, Principles of Agreement. And the idea of this paper is just to dis encourage discussion and creative thinking and to bring folks together locally and at the state level to have, the, you know, to have these discussions. Um, so it starts with recognition that the first five commissions and the regional centers both have really critical roles and they have explicit um, requirements in how they are set up. So regional centers, of course, uh, provide services to children born with developmental needs or experiencing delays with the goal of linking them to needed services and optimizing their development, and if necessary, of course, following them for life. First five commissions focus in just on zero to five, provide critical services that are not otherwise met by state-funded or state-mandated um, uh, programs with the goal, and this comes from statute, of promoting child health, school readiness, and improved family functioning. So these certainly are um, complementary, I would argue. Um, we would both agree that the earliest and most targeted interventions are the most effective, uh, that early screening and assessment are critical to ensure that kids get the earliest and most effective intervention and that families and children frequently have multiple needs and often require services from multiple programs or agencies. And in many cases, that when, when budgets get tight, what happens is that families, the cracks are bigger for families to fall through. Um, so you could argue that if the regional center system is less able to meet families' needs, then we have to look at all the other services in the community to see where those needs can, can be picked up. Um, regional centers, when you're talking about the zero to five age group, uh, regional centers are responsible for only a segment of the child population. Um, in other words, they, you know, because of the, the, the eligibility criteria and because of the list of, of um, types of developmental needs that are actually laid out in the Lanterman Act, um, there's just a subset of kids with needs. Who are, it's a large group and a high need group, but it's a subset of, of all kids with needs that the regional centers um, meet. For five commissions, on the other hand, have to do these needs assessments focused on children that aren't receiving other services and don't have access to other services. Um, we, we would agree that no single agency can meet the wide range of child and family needs in California. Um, that it benefits all agencies and the children they serve to collaborate and coordinate. And we would argue strongly, I would add here, that in tough times, that collaboration and coordination is more important. And what happens when agencies get kind of pitted against each other is that they're less likely to be collaborating and helping one another out. Um, so we would sort of conclude that California's children are ill-served when programs are pitted against each other rather than um, incentivized to work together. 
there was an interesting controversy that arose in Sacramento this week, and I don't know how many of you tracked it. The first five commission in Sacramento was um, um, <laughs> considering a proposal related to school readiness that w it was the highest ranking proposal in one of the rounds of RFPs, and it came from the Crocker Museum of Art. And so the proposal was for, I think, I don't know, either 550 or 750 thousand dollars over three years to develop uh, school readiness activities and to take those activities out to high need communities um, as well as bringing kids high need kids from high need communities into the museum well it got attacked initially by some child advocates who were saying you know when the CPS system is decimated in Sacramento how can first five think of giving money to um, a, an art museum and it was a very interesting um, debate, and I actually, it was streaming on, online, so I was able to watch it while I was at work, and you know, it was a very thoughtful discussion, because First Five does not exist simply to replace funds that have been cut from Child Protective Services. On the other hand, it does exist to continue to find ways to meet multiple needs of high-risk high kids and kids at risk of, of not succeeding in school. And after a lot of controversy, they basically put off the vote until the fall, and hopefully the state of the budget situation will be clearer by then. But there was an editorial in today's Sacramento Bee where they basically said um, that they, and if you have access to the today's Bee, you might want to look at it. They basically said that the measure, the Prop 10, clearly states that the, tobacco, the tax on tobacco products is to fund programs for children. Um, zero to five and cannot be used to replace funding for existing services. Um, and the reason that they state and remind everybody, which is very helpful, is exactly what I was saying earlier, to prevent state and local governments from shifting fiscal responsibility for ongoing public programs to first five. So they're basically saying this is they're supporting the notion that we don't want to decimate first five just because times are tough, because then it'll be gone and it's and it's doing other things that are important as well. So coming back to this issue of, of, you know, of, of, of collaboration, cooperation, sometimes what we, are, what we find, of course, is that when times are really tough, people get very creative. And actually, solutions emerge, or at least the beginnings of solutions emerge. And so what we're looking for as we go through this process and try to reach out you know, across programmatic lines is what is happening locally. What are people doing that maybe they weren't doing when they could when they were able to operate in a more siloed way with their own funding streams. And we're interested to hear whether folks on this call um, have ideas, observations, have seen things happening that actually are interesting and something that we should all share and know about. Poll number three. Okay, people are voting. So far we're up to forty one percent voting. And I should note that um, we'll be sending out a follow-up survey, um, so we can talk some during today's webinar. But for those of you who do know of local models that are going on, we'd really appreciate uh, you writing about them in the follow-up survey. There's a question that we'll ask you about it as well. You know, I think there's a, something that happens in California. California is so big, and having 58 counties with such different kinds of populations, such different needs, um, something I've observed over my many years of working in the area of public policy is what I call policy development by contagion, meaning that when something is working somewhere and some other entity locale hears about it, they, you know, they, 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 they get interested, they learn about it, and they tend to want to replicate it. Um, and a lot of times when state government is unable to make statutory change at that level, that affects our programs programs are nonetheless evolving and improving because they're learning from each other. We certainly see that in the first five world. Our association does a lot of work bringing commissions together across county lines and sharing uh, best practices, sharing outcomes, figuring out what you know what's working for different populations that are shared, different language groups, different cultural groups. So this question is really trying to get at, and I hope that we can continue to mine it after this call, after this webinar trying to get at what are some of those things that we ought to be paying attention to. OK, so here are the results. Um, 42% said yes, 58% uh, said no. Okay, so 42% of 
folks on this call have some good ideas. So I'm hoping we can actually talk about them a little bit. Um, I wanted to stop talking now because I've been talking for the better part of an hour and have a few minutes here at the end to share um, some of those, those um, observations of, from the 42 percent, but also if there are other questions that have come up, because I know some of you may be wanting more information about the, the more general political environment that First Life has been facing. Um, but this is your time, so let's, let's open it up. Please go ahead and raise your hand if you have things to add. Um, I have one hand raised. Let's see. I'm going to try Pam. Pam, are you there? Pam? Okay. Uh, Pam, if you can't speak, uh, go ahead and type in your question and I'll read it aloud. Uh, I have one comment from Riva. She says that here at EPU in uh, Fresno, uh, their early intervention program has been able to continue to serve children at risk due to First Five funding. And, and First Five Fresno did, a, did a, an interesting had an interesting strategy. As I was saying, it's really difficult to simply go in and replace funding as it's cut because of the supplementation issue. But um, First Five Fresno basically went, basically increased the size of the contract with a provider, so that that, that provider basically had you know um, wider arms to accept kids. So kids who were not making it to early start. Um, had a place to be referred to, and I think that was a, a wonderful model. And I know EPU has been very involved in that, so I think that's been a terrific, a terrific collaboration. Other and other commissions are looking at doing similar, sort of a similar thing. The other other folks out there, do you know of other models that are going on, other collaborations that are happening at the local level that you could share? No. Not seeing anything okay. yet. Okay. Well, and the, we'll certainly have this. Oh wait. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Oh, sorry. It just takes a full, few moments. Okay. Wanda. Wanda, are you there? Let's see. Wanda. Yes. There we are. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, I'm surprised. I'm from Alameda County. Our first five um, has given us has increased contracts with some of our current providers to do developmental play groups within the community um, to serve children who aren't eligible for um, regional center services um, any longer. And they've also given us a contract to do the same thing. So we have um, a, couple that, a couple of uh, developmental play groups that we are doing directly that we um, have set up with our um, Office of Education to serve children in our community. And they also gave us some additional dollars to look at um, the changes that are occurring due to the insurance mandate for early, for, uh, early start families and how to um, help families to be able to negotiate and um, that the insurance issues better along with um, our providers. So it's really helping our providers to be able to support families more in understanding the, in, the insurance mandate and as well as our um, staff. Oh, that's really great to hear. You know, um, First Five Alameda has had a close working relationship with the regional center, um, I think, for years, and was in a good position to, you know, for, for you guys to work together to figure out how to pick up some of that need. Um, First Five Alameda has reported that to the rest of the association, and I know other counties are very interested in learning um, how that's going. I know First Five Humboldt actually um, it started. They they. You know, they serve a large rural area and a lot of Native um, uh, American areas. And because they have very you know, relatively few early education programs, they actually for a long time have supported playgroups. And what they're noticing is that the, the developmental needs are showing up much more in those playgroups. So they've started funding specialists to go out to those playgroups um, you know, that meet three times a week or something. Um, so they, it's a similar thing where they're where the need the need is just arising in programs that they already funded, and so they're addressing it a little bit differently. While First Life Alameda is more targeting those kids who explicitly lost the services. I think that's a real model in, in Alameda. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi. This is Randall uh, Marks in San Diego. Hi, Randall. 
Hi, uh, the San Diego First Five, we have a, a, a healthy developmental services project that looks to serve children with mild to moderate needs. So these are kids that wouldn't necessarily qualify for regional center. But we uh, recently uh, teamed up with our child welfare services and our early child mental health departments to do a larger project to uh, look at kids that have uh, real complex, hard to diagnose developmental and behavioral problems. And First Five is, is providing the funding for this, and mental health is using a piece of that to draw down um, basically 85% more dollars from the early, the EPSDT funding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. our dollars are leveraging um, $150,000 is leveraging another 80, 850000 So we've got a million dollar mental health program for a, a rather small investment. And those are some of the kids that may not uh, qualify for regional center, but they have something diagnosable. Right. And so we're trying to find ways to team with some of our other county agencies to meet some of those needs. Yeah, and that approach, it's sort of the SART approach. It's kind of like the, the um, what EPU is involved in in First Five Fresno, I mm -hmm. mean, with First Five Fresno, which is screening, assessment, referral, and treatment. Yeah, this is, this is uh, similar to that, yes. And it's a wonderful way to bring all those different agencies together. And sometimes First Five funding is really the glue and kind of the motivation to bring folks together. And then the good thing about First Five Dollars is that they are legitimate dollars to be used to leverage federal funds. Yes. Um, you can't do that with foundation dollars, but you can do it with First Five. So that, that's been really helpful. Thanks, Randall. Does anyone else want to give one, one last example? Because I've, we'll also, oh, yes, uh-huh. Oh, yeah, sorry. I have a few uh, questions typed in over here. Okay. Um, one's from L.A. Uh, they say, um, our early intervention programs in L.A. County are having difficulties with the reduction in families to early start. And in our area, we've been encouraging them to look at expanding their services to other populations. Is there someone at First 5 L.A. that we can discuss on how to add this resource? Yeah, and maybe wh whoever this person is, can, I can talk to directly after the call because um, it, I, I can explain kind of what, what First Five LA is doing and we can figure out how to make that link. Um, is it possible, Tara, for you to hook me, I mean, for us to get hooked? Yes, absolutely, phone? absolutely. Okay, great. Um, another question is from Pam. Uh, she says, I want to know what the thinking is behind reducing funding to special needs children. These families and children have no control over the situation, so how is it being justified? You know, I think it's not being justified. I mean, it's, um, I mean, it's really, when you hear the, when you go to this, the, but the legislative budget hearings and you see the people who, who are there to testify against these cuts, it is just heartbreaking. Um, there truly is no justification, and the only reason cuts are being made is because there's not enough revenue in the state to fund everything. Um, and we have a situation where the legislature, you know, basically can't or won't raise revenues, and you know, because there's a, mo you know, most members, at least of the Republican caucus, have taken a no new tax pledge and they apply that to any new revenue being raised. Um, so when you can't raise more money, and the amount of money that's coming in is insufficient because there's a recession, you know, it just you know, ends up with too little funding. And the other thing that really complicates it is that it takes two-thirds vote to pass the budget. Um, so people in the legislature who really do not place a high priority on these programs um, you know, they, they win some concessions in the budget discussion around and get more cuts. So it's a really very sad situation. I don't think there's probably anyone on this call who would try to defend it. I think we're just trying to figure out how to cope and get through. Great. It looks like that's all the questions we have, and we seem to be out of time. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Sherry. Yeah, my pleasure. And I do hope people will um, do the follow-up survey so we can continue to hear from you.
Yes, so over the next day or two, you'll receive a follow-up survey by email. Please take the time to complete it. Um, and if you aren't already on our listserv, please visit our website at familyvoicesofca.org to sign up. Um, if you have any follow-up questions that didn't occur to you today and you want to ask, go ahead and email us and we'll get back to you. Um, and next month's webinar is on Wednesday, June 2nd at 12 uh, with health access. So I hope you all join us then. And thanks again, Sherry. It's been really wonderful. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.